morning and Merry Christmas. It's so good to see all of you. I'm Tony Wallace, or one of the pastors here at Silverdale, and I get the privilege each week of sharing with you God's Word. So this is what I'd like for you to do. Go and take your Bibles, open a New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, and then do this. Take out your Bible study outlines. They're found right here in the center of your bulletin. You can follow along and take notes. As most of you know, we've been in a series called You're Invited. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at the four invitations that God gave that first Christmas. I mean, did you know that every person that was involved in the first Christmas was invited there by God? God invited Mary through an appearance of an angel. God invited Joseph through a dream. God invited, as we saw last week, the shepherds through a, you know, myriad of hosts. All these angels invited them to Bethlehem. And today we're going to see that the wise men were invited there through a star. So today we're going to learn from the wise men that God invites us to worship him. Now my very first encounter with the wise men was actually whenever I was eight years old. I was cast as a part of a wise men in our church annual um, Christmas pageant. Only eight years old, but I was asked to be a wise man, which is awesome. But the problem was is that one of my best friends was also cast as a wise man. His name was Ronnie. That's not a problem. We didn't have a problem with each other. The problem was our mothers had a problem with each other. You see, um, there was this little um, ongoing competitiveness, and they wanted to uh, one-up each other. And so my mom, when she found out that Ronnie also was going to be um, cast as a wise man, she wanted to make sure that her son was dressed more elaborately, more um, dignified, more beautifully than any other wise man in the history of Christianity. And so um, that night of the production, I showed up and I was dazzled with all these clothes. I had jewelry all over me. I had rings literally on every finger. I was a cross between rapper um, Slick Rick and Liberace. Okay? <laughs> No lie, that's the combination of those two, that's sort of what I look like, okay? And you go, what in the world? Yeah, I mean, literally, I was the focus of the play. Look at that kid up there. Why? Because even in the middle of a Christmas play, we can lose our perspective. We can get distracted. Well, that is not the case with the wise men. The wise men were these guys that they had a laser focus that they desired to worship Jesus Christ. And so let's read about their story. It's found in Matthew chapter 2, beginning verse 1. Look at what God's word says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at the rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. They're quoting here, in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. He's lying, isn't he? Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way and there it was, the star they had seen in its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Now, verse 11 is critical. Entering the house, notice it's no longer a manger. They saw the child, notice he's no longer a baby, with Mary his mother and falling to their knees, they worship him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. And so that's the story of the wise men. And today we're going to learn from them. I heard a little preschooler once tell the giving and the gifts of the wise men. They said, you know, the wise men came and presented gifts of gold, Frankenstein and Smurfs. Well, not quite. 
But yes, they did come and they came to worship Christ. Now, whenever we think about the wise men, there's typically one big question that comes to our mind. And it's this. Who are the wise men, right? I mean, these foreigners, they're not Jews. How do they even know about the Messiah? I mean, what's the deal? Where do they come from? Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about the wise men. I mean, there is a tradition that there were three wise men, right? Sing the song, we three kings of Orient are. But we don't know if there were three. There were obviously three gifts. Could there be three? Yes. Maybe there's just two. Could there be five? Could there be 15? We do not know how many were in the entourage of the wise men, but we know there was more than one. The second myth about this is that they came the night of Jesus' birth, just like the shepherds did. But that's not the case. According to the Bible, they came when? They didn't come to a manger. They came to a house. And then secondly, you know, they came to Jesus. Jesus wasn't a baby. He was a child. And so they came weeks, maybe months, after the birth of Jesus Christ. But you go, well, who are they? Well, they were some of the most educated, intelligent men of that day. They were most likely from Persia or Babylon. I mean, that's modern-day Iran and Iraq. In fact, here's a picture of an ancient ruins of a Magi temple. They were incredibly powerful, incredibly brilliant. In fact, Pastor John MacArthur writes this about the wise men. He says this, Because of their combined knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history, and astrology, they became the most prominent and powerful group of advisors in the Medo-Persian and subsequently the Babylonian Empire. These guys were powerful. They were influential. In fact, in the Persian kingdom, you could not become a king unless you got approved by the magi, by the wise men. So these guys... They're rich, they're powerful, they're influential, they're kingmakers. And they show up in the capital city of Jerusalem, and what are they doing? They're looking for their king, the newborn king. There's a problem. There's already a king reigning in Jerusalem. His name is Herod the Great. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to see a contrast between the heart of Herod and the heart of the wise men. And what I'd like for you to do is just literally before God, ask the Lord, whose heart am I most like? Am I more like Herod or am I more like the wise men? And so check it out. Let's first describe Herod. Jot this on your outline. The selfish heart of Herod. The selfish heart of Herod. Now, Herod was ruthless. He lived a lavish lifestyle and he protected that lavish lifestyle, you know, at any cost. In fact, I would say that Herod is the very first Grinch who tried to steal Christmas. He really is. I mean, I know that most of us heard of Dr. Seuss's book, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, and of course it just recently came out on the theaters, a new version of it. But Herod is the first and ultimate Grinch. Why? Because of his heart. Just like the Grinch, his heart was probably three sizes too small, right? In fact, every time I hear that song, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, I think of Herod. Because he was the very first Grinch, and his heart was a selfish heart. Now, how do you know it's a selfish heart? Well, there's two characteristics of a selfish heart. Jot this on your outline. First of all, Herod had a disturbed heart. He had a disturbed heart. That's how it's described in the scriptures. Look at it again, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews. Now that's significant because Herod was appointed the king. Jesus was born the king. For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. In your outline, circle the word disturbed. What does that mean? It's an interesting word. It means agitated. It means to be stirred up. It means to worry, have anxiety, to have fear. You go, what in the world would this powerful king, Herod, have to fear of this baby, Jesus, being born in Bethlehem? Well, well, it's pretty significant. Here you have these powerful, influential kingmakers, these magi, these wise men, and they're looking to worship this newborn king? Oh my goodness, no wonder he was disturbed, because suddenly his throne was being challenged. And he could have said, hey, there's already king of the Jews, it's me. I mean, I'm the one reigning, and nobody's going to take my throne. Now, Herod had that kind of mindset. In fact, on multiple occasions, he would go after and he would kill anyone who threatened his throne. He had three sons. Herod eventually killed all three of his sons because he thought they were plotting to take over his throne. 
Herod killed his brother-in-law. Herod even killed his wife, all because he had this fear, this jealousy, that she was going to somehow take over the throne. He had a disturbed heart. Why? Because he was all about his control. Don't get in my territory. I want the control. I want the power. Now, I don't know about you, there are times in my life when I like the control and I like the power. You know, whenever it sort of stirs up in me, it's many times during Christmas time. Have you ever played that, um, that Christmas game called White Elephant Exchange, right? I mean, everybody brings these ridiculous gifts, maybe $10 gifts, and I don't know what it is. Something wells up within me like, I want to win. I want to win. I want to get the best gift of these stupid gifts. I want to get that, right? And I'm going to control. I'm going to steal. I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to do what I can do so that I can get the best gift, right? Years ago, I, um, I won a clapper at one of those gifts, one of those gift exchanges. I don't know if you ever had a clapper before. They're, they're just crazy cool. I mean, the fact is, is that as soon as you get a clapper, you immediately revert back to middle school. And here I am around the house, clap on, clap off. And just driving Susan crazy, she says, get that thing out of the house. So I gave it to church. <laughs> Clap on. <laughs> Clap off. <laughs> Clap on. There you go. That's power, right? <laughs> That's what we all want. We want that kind of power. You know, children, one of the first words they'll say is, mine or no. Why? Because that's, they want the control. They want the power. I, I mean, think about, it's not just kids. I mean, because kids will obviously, they will fight with each other and wrestle with each other. But, you know, we as adults do the same thing. Whenever somebody begins to get into my territory... You know, maybe somebody at work is parking in your space, or, or that neighbor, you know, is encroaching into your yard, or, or that spouse doesn't give you the respect you think you're due, or that person at work gets a little praise that you think you should get. Suddenly, there's something in her heart that goes, Argh. I'm agitated by that, right? That's Herod. Herod had a selfish heart. It was troubled. And when your heart gets troubled like that, you know, man, I'm looking at the world through my selfish heart. But there's a second characteristic of his heart, and it's this. He had an insincere heart. Got that down. An insincere heart. He was a hypocrite. Herod was like most politicians. He was a two-faced phony. Now, I know that may be a shock to you. <gasps> what? Politicians don't tell the truth? Politicians are two-faced? Oh, my goodness. Who would have known? You mean they'll say one thing to one group and then say something else to another group? Yes. That's exactly who Herod was. Right? So these, you know, wise men show up. He doesn't know where the king is going to be born. So what does he do? He goes to the priest and he asks for information. Check it out in verse 4. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. Because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah... Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now here's what's amazing to me. Herod believed God's word. I mean, Herod believed that God had predicted in his word that a Messiah was coming. And that he even knew that God's word told where the Messiah was going to be born. He's going, he's asking these priests. Now, was he asking these priests, oh, I, I want to know where the Messiah is going to be born so that I can worship Jesus? Obviously not. His plan is to kill Jesus. That's his plan, okay? Which means this guy's incredibly self-deceived and arrogant. Think of this. He believes God's word, but he thinks he's more powerful than God's word. I mean, he believes that God's going to send a Messiah, but he thinks that he can somehow thwart God's plan and kill the Messiah. That's what's amazing to me. He believed God's word, but he thought he was bigger than God's word. But you know what? Aren't we just like him? Did you know that the Bible says in the last days that people that call themselves Christians will have a form of godliness but deny the power? That you know what, we'll look good sort of on the outside, we'll look real religious, but the reality is, is that we believe God's word, but we think that we're above God's word. 
We know God's word tells us to do things and commands us to do things and encourages us to do things. And we go, no, I'm going to follow my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. I know what God's word says, but I am bigger than God's word. You're fooling yourself. And the Bible says this. You know, we go off and we sin. We do our own thing. And God says, you know, in Galatians, we said it. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Look, there's going to come a harvest day. In, in this lifetime or the next, there's always a harvest day. You don't get away with sin. You're not bigger than God, and you're not bigger than God's word. And so here's Herod. He thinks that he is. That's his plan. And so what does he do next? He brings the wise men in. Check it out, verse 7. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men. You go, why secretly? I'll tell you why. Because everybody in Jerusalem knew what kind of tyrant he was. And he asked them the exact time the star appeared. Why do you do that? Because he wanted to know the estimated age of this child. Verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I mean, that's not his plan. I mean, telling Herod where the Messiah was born, the location of that is like telling Hitler where Jews are hidden. Right? I mean, this guy has one plan. It's to kill the Messiah. And that's why God warned the Magi, not to go back to Herod, but to go another route home. And then a few weeks later, Herod realizes, oh my goodness, the wise men have tricked me. They didn't come back to me. Check it out. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. I love that phrase. He was, you know, outwitted by the wise men. He was tricked, and he realized, okay, they didn't come back to me, so i got to figure this out on my own. My plan was just to kill one child. Now I've got to kill every child two years and younger in Bethlehem. You see, what happens is because his goal was blocked, he got aggravated. And then what happened? He got aggressive. That's what I often see in folks' lives. See, when you're living selfishly for you, and then somebody blocks your goal, you get all agitated. And then that agitation turns to aggressiveness. It's almost like you've got a volcano on the inside, and it's stirring and stirring and stirring, and then somebody blocks your goal, and you just bleh, throw up all over them. You know, the fact is, is that some of you, that's a description of you. And what does that tell you? That tells you you've got a messed up heart. You've got a troubled heart, and you've got an insincere heart. You may believe God's word, but I'm telling you, you somehow are acting like you're above God's word. And so that is Herod. Herod has a selfish heart, and if we're honest, we look a lot like Herod sometimes. But now let's contrast Herod with the wise men. These guys have amazing hearts. In fact, this is what I want you to jot down about them. They had devoted hearts. The devoted hearts of the wise men. They're incredibly devoted to Christ. They have this laser focus on Jesus Christ. They're rich, they're powerful, and yet they left their homes, they make this perilous journey, they travel for months. Why? Because they want to worship this child. It's amazing to me. I mean, I can just imagine that neighbors of the, the wise men there in Babylon may say, okay, uh, you're going on a journey? Yes. Do you know where you're going to go? No, not completely. Do you know how long the trip will be? No, really don't know that either. Do you know how long you're going to be gone? No, nope, don't know that either. For guys called wise men, you don't know much, right? Well, that's who these guys are. They're making an incredible journey of faith. They're following God. Why are they making all these you know, decisions? Because they have a secret, devoted heart. It's like their mission. We want to find Christ. And so how do you have a devoted heart? It takes two things. Jot this on your outline. First of all, they were seekers. They were seekers. They had this laser focus that they were seeking after Christ. You know the problem with a lot of us? Is that we don't have that focus on Jesus Christ. But we're, we get so easily distracted, especially during the Christmas season. 
And we, we get distracted with the shopping and the decorations and the gifts or the travel or the family or, you know, even, you know, church productions or, you know, um, it's all about the kids. No, it's not all about the kids. It's all about Jesus, okay? Everything else is secondary. It's got to be all about Jesus. You see, it's real easy that we forget what this was all about. It's designed for us to invite us to worship Christ. That's what this is all about. Years ago, there was these boys, I mean, these children that were asked, what is the true meaning of Christmas? This one boy, his name was Joey, he's eight years old, he said this, Christmas is the one time each year when it's okay to get fat because it brings you closer to Santa Claus. <laughs> Abby, age six, put it this way, Christmas is when Jesus was born. And a lot of reindeer got good jobs because they needed animals that could travel fast to tell about his birth. Well, she was a little confused there, right? And part of it was right. Well, it's easy for us to get distracted. The wise men did not get distracted. Check it out. Look at how this is written in verse 1. Wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. Now, this is one of the huge mysteries about the wise men. Because you're like, how did they know? Right? I mean, they're not Jewish. They're, they're foreigners. They didn't have the whole Bible. What's going on here? I mean, think about it. You had the religious priests that were just a few miles away from Bethlehem in Jerusalem. They didn't know the Messiah had been born. How did these foreigners know the Messiah had been born? How did that happen? Well, you see, they had a seeker's heart, and God led them. In fact, the very same way that God led the wise men are the very same way that God will guide you. In fact, on your outline, I've put down the three ways that God guides you. I want you to jot this down because just like he guided the wise men this way, he'll guide you this way. Ready? Jot this down. First of all, God guides you through the principles of his word. God guides you through the principles of God's word. Now you may go, wait a minute, Pastor Tony. These guys didn't have the word of God. Well, they didn't have all of the Word of God, but we do know they at least had part of the Word of God. You go, what part did they have? They had the book of Daniel. You, you see, the word magi or wise men, this isn't the first time it was mentioned in the Bible. It's found in the book of Daniel. Remember Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel? Check it out. Look how he's described in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many generous gifts. He made him ruler over the entire providence of Babylon, and check this out, and chief governor over all the wise men. You see, Daniel became the chief leader over all the wise men of his day. And so what had happened, he wrote down the book of Daniel, and it must have been that present-day wise men were studying these great teachings of their greatest wise men, who was Daniel himself. And if they studied the book of Daniel, then we know something. They studied Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel predicts when the Messiah was to be born. It's called Daniel's 70 Weeks. In fact, it is so accurate in telling the time frame of when the Messiah was to be born, for centuries, skeptics go, there's no way that was in the Bible. I mean, Christians must have added those verses in Daniel 9 later on. I mean, there's no way it could have been that accurate pointing to when the Messiah was to be born. And yet, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, oh, there's Daniel 9 predicting the time frame of when the Messiah was to be born. You see, these guys had studied the scriptures and they realized the time frame of when the Messiah was to be born. That's the way God is. God will predominantly give you his will and guidance through the word of God. When you open up the Bible, God opens his mouth to you. That's why the psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 119. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God will guide you through the principles of God's word. But there's a second way that God guides you. Jot this down. God guides you from the counsel of other people. God will guide you through the counsel of other people. You see, here comes these wise men. They come into Jerusalem. They think they got it all figured out. They're smart, right? Okay, new king's been born in Israel. Where do you go? You go to the capital. Capital's Jerusalem. Okay, all right. He's bound to be in the palace, so they come to the king's palace looking for the new king. Well, the new king's not there. They need some guidance. They need somebody to help them out, right? Herod asked the priest. The priests say Bethlehem. They go, okay, awesome. And they head off, boom, to Bethlehem. 
Why? Because they were guided by the counsel of other people. Do you understand that? Wise men ask for directions. Gentlemen, let me say that again. <laughs> Wise men ask for directions, okay? You get a little guidance from other people. That's what's happened over and over again. That's what the Bible says. Look at it. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Plans fail for the lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. God will guide you through the wisdom of other people. Searching the scriptures, other counsel of others. Third way God guides you is this. Jot this down. Through providential circumstances. Through providential circumstances. You see, our God is sovereign over all. He is Lord over all. He's Lord over your life, and he's Lord over the circumstances of your life, and he's Lord over even all of nature. And so God can open doors, God can close doors. God can providentially order and guide your life. He can do that. You go, well, what was the providential guidance of the wise men? It was the star. You see, stargazers back then, they would see constellations and, and certain planets that would go into those constellations, and they would, you know, interpret that in certain ways. They would see, you know, novas and supernovas or comets, and they would interpret, okay, God's trying to communicate. You go, well, what was it? What was the star of Jesus? Well, I believe it was a supernatural star. I mean, I believe that God created this star just for Jesus, okay? But it was a providential circumstance that God used. And so think about it. Here are these wise men, guided through the scriptures, guided through others, guided by the star, providential circumstances. But do you know why they got it? It's because they had a seeker's heart. Let me tell you something. If you don't have a heart that really seeks after God, you can study the scripture, you can listen to others, you can try to read the providential circumstances. You will not follow after God. You've got to have a seeker's heart. In fact, look at what the Bible says. Jeremiah 29, 13. I love this promise. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Wise men still seek after Jesus, okay? And so that's why they had a devoted heart, because they were seekers. But there's another reason why they had a devoted heart, and it's this. They were not only seekers, they were also worshipers. They were worshipers. I mean, over and over again in this passage, we've come to worship him. We've come to worship him. Then what happens? They see Jesus and they worship him. See, it's amazing to me, Jesus was not some puzzle, answer to some puzzle from Daniel chapter 9. No, Jesus was the one they came to worship. That's why whenever they found Jesus in the house, they didn't, you know, pose for a picture and then go back to Persia. No, they fell down and they worshipped him. Check it out, look at it, verse 11. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. In your outline, circle the word worshipped him. Now, this is significant. These are royal officials from another country. For them to fall down and worship another human, that, that's significant. Why? Because they knew Jesus was different. I mean, of all the thousands of children that were born, they knew this child was different. Who was he? Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. Do you understand that God took on human flesh in the person of his son, Jesus Christ? That's who they understood. This is no mere man. He is God with us. That's what Daniel had predicted, that this one would be the one who would rule over anyone else. And so they worshipped him. And then what did they do? They worshipped him by giving him gifts. Check out these gifts. Verse 11, look at it again. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, to be honest, those are sort of strange gifts to give a child. Okay, first of all, gold. Now, we get gold. Everybody likes gold, right? If you ever wonder, I wonder what to give somebody, give them gold. They'll love you for it. Everybody loves gold, right? Why did they give Jesus gold? Because gold represented royalty. They were saying, we acknowledge you are the true king. Daniel predicted that you would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords who would rule over all kings one day. So they gave him gold, signifying that. But they also gave him frankincense. Now, frankincense, why frankincense? What was that? that that's actually an incense that was used in worship. And priests would burn frankincense as part of their worship. And so what were they doing? They were acknowledging Jesus, you're going to be the great high priest that's going to bring us to God. 
You're going to be the ultimate priest for all of humanity. You're the king, but you're also the priest. But then what's really interesting is the last thing they gave Jesus. What is that? Myrrh. They gave him myrrh. You go, what was myrrh used for? Myrrh was a burial spice. It was an ointment. Myrrh was what you would do that you would anoint dead people with. You go, golly, that's a morbid thing to give a child, right? Why would they do that? Well, Daniel had predicted in Daniel 9 that this anointed one, the Messiah, was going to be killed. Now, I don't know if they fully understood the ramifications of all this, but the fact is, is that they acknowledged that one day this great king was going to be killed. Not just die naturally, no, be murdered. And so they were worshiping him by giving him even, you know, myrrh. Now, think about those three things. Jesus is the king. Jesus is your priest. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for your sins. That's who Jesus Christ is. And when you really understand who Jesus Christ is, that's when you're really going to worship him. You see, as long as you think that you're the Lord of your life, you're not going to worship Christ. As long as you think that you're good enough to get yourself to God on your own, you're not going to worship Christ. As long as you think that, you know what, you're not all that bad, you don't need any Savior to die for your sins, you're not going to worship Christ. But whenever you understand, like I understand, like most of us understand, that we are sinners in need of a Savior... That when we understand that there's no way we could ever get ourselves to God without Jesus Christ, if we understand that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, we will worship him like never before. That's what we're called to do. We are called to have a worshiper's heart. Listen, wise men still seek him today. Are you seeking him today? Are you worshiping him today? These men were wise, not because they were seeking Jesus, but because they found Jesus. And so... Be honest for a second. Your heart. Imagine you're standing before God one day. He knows your heart. He knows everything about you. Is your heart more like Herod or is it more like the wise men? Is your heart more like, okay, I want to get my way. I want to be in control. And you get frustrated with everybody that blocks your goals. Or do you have a laser focus? You know what? I am a seeker of Christ and I want to worship him. What's your heart most like? I believe the Holy Spirit is going to ask you this Christmas, will you take on a heart like the wise men? And if your heart is anything close to Herod's heart, will you repent of that sin and call on Christ today? Because God has called us to be wise men. God's called us to be wise women, people of God, that will have a devoted heart to Christ. This was an invitation to worship. So we need to worship the way we should.